Hello Prince Crew LDN. As you know, we're looking to make a homeless documentary. And to do that, we figured we'd start to investigate and look at people that are actually handling this crisis, that are actually on the front line of this issue in this, this country. And we're starting with Solomon Smith, the founder of The Soup Kitchen. My name is Solomon Smith. Um, I'm the founder of a homeless charity called Bricks and Soup Kitchen. And um, basically one of our main um, objectives is to tackle homelessness in the UK. But at the same time, what can we do to better them as people? So even if it's kind of kind of getting them back into work, getting them back into education, training, um, and just kind of helping them to even start volunteering. So it's just about just what can we do to get them back into civilization? It's getting them back into volunteering and also giving them advice. I could give advice and employment here as well. So that's like CV building, yeah. getting them, because volunteering, of course, that counts as work experience to get an employment as well, right? You know, a lot of the times people think helping a homeless person is by giving them something to eat. And that's so not the case. Food is not their main priority. Their main priority is about what can I do to keep sane in this cruel world where everybody's going home, especially when it hits that Christmas. Everybody's going home, nice warm house. I'm on the streets, you know, and this is where I've thought about it in different aspects, not just giving food, but clothing and mental health and, you know, so definitely trying to get them into work, you know, is like, would be one of the biggest pinnacles for them to be self-sustainable but also at the same time to be working as a group of people and then that allows them to be you know back in civilization we used to get a lot of donations from like greg's and greg's you know they do like a lot of donuts and sandwiches etc so the contract what we used to have with greg's that if we're collecting today the food has to be eaten by the next day so what I would do is is I would bring it into the soup kitchen but we close by two o'clock but then my centre would um would start by four o'clock. So I'll say guys this has to be eaten by six o'clock and then and then the first thing the guys would say is oh you know is this homeless people food? I'm like what do you mean homeless people food? Food's food. You know what I mean? They eat what we eat, they drink what we drink, you know what I mean? And that's that like one one of the main things I didn't want to do as well is a lot of the supermarkets that they will be like, oh, yeah, this is damaged, oh, you can take it. I'm, I'm like, no, you know, I want to get proper food, what you would eat. Don't give me food was dropped on the floor. You see what I'm saying? So it's about changing that whole dynamic of what society thinks, what corporate thinks. You know, homeless people are human too. You know, and that's one of the biggest, biggest ethos that I go with. So you say you get donations from Nando's and Greg's. Yes. Yes. How did that come about? Like, who approached who? Do you know what? That was so funny because when I first started the soup kitchen, we didn't have social media, in Facebook, nothing. I was just kind of just using my own Facebook and kind of pulling it out, saying guys are looking for volunteers to help out the soup kitchen. But I didn't know a lot of people was kind of sharing it and you know kind of passing it on. And then um, I literally got a phone call. You know, you know when you're seeing, especially with iPhones, you know, you can see what area the person's calling you from. And I, I was, and I got a call from Tennessee, and I was thinking, this was literally about a month of, and this is that like the first time, you know, um, yeah. So we was running for a month. So I've never really learned how to kind of work with corporates before. I never really learned how to speak their language. That is something I've, I was kind of putting a deep in. And it was like, um, yeah, just I would literally close up the soup kitchen, driving home, and then I got a random call. And then, you know, they was like, hey, is this Solomon? You know, we heard that you run a soup kitchen to the homeless. And I'm like, yeah. And they was like, oh, basically we run the franchise of Nando's. Mm -hmm. So we're the head office, but we run all the franchises in Tennessee. In Tennessee. Yeah, and I was like, and I was like, what? And then, um, by bearing in mind, we wasn't a charity. We wasn't. We was just a name who was just providing a service. So, um, and they said, you know what? We want to come down and have a meeting with you. I said, huh? You're gonna come all the way down from America? To come? They said, yeah. 
bearing in mind it was Tuesday, they come down on a Friday and the meeting didn't last no more than 10 minutes. They said, yep. So we go to the Bricks and Nando's, Cam Camberwell, Streatham, and literally we pick up up to 60 pieces of chicken every Mondays and Thursdays. And literally, um, you know, half will go to families and half will be kind of um, making on site. The supposedly homeless food that you do here is Nando's and Greg's, which everyone yeah. eats. I know Prince Quill there and we eat a lot of Nando's. <laughs> Nando's is great. That's awesome. So, when you first started the soup kitchen, you were a youth worker, right? I believe, yeah. or a social worker, a youth, youth worker, worker, and you started the soup kitchen out of your own wages. You? you had no funding. Actually, you still don't have any still. government funding to this day, don't you? Yeah. Like my story basically is, um, I had I've got learning difficulties. So, from school, I can kind of see like all of my friends, who's like very good at reading and writing. And when it comes to exams, they're very good at just doing the exam. But me and my twin brother will be looking at each other like, "What the hell is going on?" Like, we literally can't fathom what's kind of going on. You know, left school with no GCSEs. Um, at 16, you know, I've never experienced going to college ever, because if you had no GCSEs, you couldn't go to college. But in my time, we had a thing called training courses. So you could redo your English and you get paid £50 a week. So from 15, um, I think they changed it to EMA, where EMA now they put they give you £30 a week. Well, there's no EMA now. They, how did they even do that no more? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so literally I was doing that for a bit and then... Um, I started just doing my own little community events on my estate and then that's when I was realised I was quite good at kind of helping young people, helping young people with knife crime, gun crime, drugs, etc. Try to turn people away from crime, etc. And then, um, yeah, done that until I was about 21, 22. And then um, my manager at the time was like, you know you could um, go to university as a mature student. And I was like, how? Like, I've never, I left school with no GCSEs, no qualifications, i still got no qualifications. How am I going to go to university? And literally, um, done the UCAS form, um, and, I, and I actually got into about three different universities. So I, that was Applied Social Science and Youth and Community. And the day I started my lectures, the day I felt like I was at school again, I was like, I can't do it. Like, everything they're talking is going right over my head. Like, I'm not understanding. And then literally I was walking around the uni and then I saw a thing called dyslexic awareness. And then that's when I kind of went into there and then I was just like, you know, I think I might might have a bit of learning difficulties. Um, done the assessment and then literally, you know, once they, my assessment was so high, they gave me another assessment in the West End. And then when I went in there, I was, I was found to have the highest um, spec of um, dyslexia and and autistic as well so i always thought there was something kind of different with me because you know the way how i kind of do things is you know i've it's very repeated you know everybody knows if i go into the car there's a, the same music i would always play you know the way i would always do things is always the same so that's when i found out i was autistic and severely dyslexic as well but then that's when i got a lot of support so they gave me things that would help me to read there'll be things that would read to me pick up the lecture etc and then that's when i actually um completed the course and you know that's when i got a degree that was one of my biggest achievements ever the day i handed in my dissertation um my, like my last piece of work at university is the day i started the soup kitchen you know at the same time i was working part-time as a youth worker so i've been working for the council for about almost 16 years literally i've seen the changes from having a lot of funding to absolutely zero like summer's like summer's here now a lot of youth clubs has got zero funding mm. so and it was literally i remember every time i was getting paid i had to go tesco's buy you know buy biscuits tea bags cups literally spending at least three to four hundred pound a month just for the soup kitchen and i've done that for like three years 
literally for about three years of running the soup kitchen, I just kind of spent my own money. And then um, once kind of people started to see that, you know, I was actually being serious about it, is when we was getting quite a lot of people kind of wanted to support. So we've got, you know, we'll get a random check coming in for like 300 pound, a thousand pound, 500 pound. Then trust will kind of get involved and trust will be like, you know, oh, we're seeing the great work you're doing, 500 pound here, you know, and that's literally how we've been surviving. But it's not, it's not enough for us to kind of pay staff but it is enough for us to kind of like keep the lights on and to um you know maybe go cash and carry them you know buy more food etc etc you said you never started with any government funding and you still don't have any government mm. funding why is that firstly it was because of my dyslexia so with government funding it's about an application form and the application form has to be worded so precisely mm. what they like you know, and, and people who's very good at doing that, they charge. And at the time, we didn't really have funds to do that. And um, once we started to get the funders to reach out to us, saying, how come you've not really reached out to us, is when they had a lot of stipulations. So they will say, oh, you can only work with people from Lambeth from this age to that age. But for us, what makes us so unique, we're an open door policy. So anyone from anywhere could come in, we don't care about your race, religion, postcode. If you need support, you get support, you know. And for me, who's worked in the council for um, over 16 years, I've seen the division of if you're not from Lambeth, young people couldn't come on a trip where I had to lie on the application form and say, no, you don't say you're from Southwark, say you're from Lambeth, just so you can come on the trip. So I said, if I'm gonna ever start up something of my own, I'm gonna do it where I don't care about your, about your borough. And a lot of the funders are saying, we, we only could fund if you're working with different boroughs. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's been a bit of a, been a bit difficult, Red. So what I understood about that is, you, the funders, they approached you and mm -hmm. gave you stipulations. They tried to control you, mm -hmm. tried to say you can't work with this person, you can't help that person. And you, and you as a good humanitarian, decided to say, well, sod that. I'm going to go do my own thing and help whoever I want. And that's why, you know, we've done, we've, we've done some stuff in Miami. You know, we've done some stuff in... So we've been working in Miami for like four years. Downtown Miami, the homelessness over there is... is, is is crazy. Um, we've done some stuff in Toronto as well, where we even made on the Toronto news. Um, we've done some stuff in Jamaica, so we're literally at the process of trying to get land where we can kind of build a soup kitchen there. But the government over there is so corrupt. The Jamaican one. Yeah. So they are literally the hardest ones for us to work with. Even harder than the Lambeth boroughs. The yeah. Why is that? I mean, you're just helping out people that can't eat. What's the... Everything to them is to do with money. Everything to them is to do with money. Even if I'm saying to them, guys, this is a charity, you know, we're a fully registered charity now, they're like, no. You know, we was working with, um, we was working with Nike, and you know, Nike donated us like, you know, a lot of trainers, you know, and we, and we, um, I think it was over a thousand pairs of trainers. And what I done was, is I said, right, let me take about fifty pairs to Jamaica, so I can kind of get it onto um, to the homeless's feet in Jamaica. Um, they wanted to charge me. Literally, I had it in a barrel, and I was like, no. Nope. For each chain of hair could be sold. And I'm thinking, sold? Like, that's the last thing on my mind. You know, right now I want to feed, you know, I want to put trainers on homeless people's feet in Jamaica. They was like, no, we have to charge you this. You know, they wanted to charge me over £500. Even though you're a registered charity and well known charity, they're still treating you like some sort of business. Like, you're just go going over there to sell a market. They don't recognize that, you know, you're humanitarian trying to help people. They just didn't even consider that fact at all? No, no, no. They was just like, we need money right now. And I was like, I could not believe this is happening. Now it's over there, you know, oh, willing. Jamaica, yeah, I was in Jamaica and I was like, no, we need money right now. I was like, no, they don't make sense. In London right now, it's estimated nearly 9,000 people are homeless. I think like, it's way more than that. Wait, you think it's way more? I mean, yeah. that's, well, you, can't, you don't know which statistics. They're always up and down, always up in the air. But even so, that's still like a high record, mm. a record-breaking number. Yeah. And you say there's probably even more. Mm -hmm. Do you think this crisis is actually being recognised for the true seriousness that it is? I think 
it is recognised, but it's embarrassing. We've always, people's always said, how come the government's not helping? How come the government's not helping? The work what we're doing is what the government should be doing, mm. you know. And I think what they don't want is to have that embarrassment over them. I don't know if you guys remember. Do you remember the when the Olympics, the 2012 Olympics, yeah. were here? What they done is they done a sh they done a a street sweep. So they literally gave every homeless person like a hundred pound, and they said, "Get out of London." get out of London and that's why on the 2012 Olympics it was just so it was crystal clean didn't see no homeless people was like oh there's no homeless they d literally done a sweep and then a lot of them went to the seaside we do a lot of outreach as well over Brighton and there was like yeah we was in London and we're here but we can't get back we've got no money so we've literally just been here since since 2012 so they kicked him out the whole entire city not even just out of the stadium area the whole city from that's a little, a little extreme and that I, and that is like what you will see like you know if there's like a royal wedding you know i remember when we had princess diana coming to brixton you know there was painting f um lamp posts and making the street look clean you know but it's like a facade because it's not always like that you know, it's only, it's only when, when royalty comes into that, to an area, they make sure they focus on the area, they clean that area, make sure it looks spick and span. But I'm saying that if they can do that, I imagine what they can do. And then when I saw that with the homelessness, I was like, wow, literally. Yeah, I think it's more to deal with opportunities. So a lot of homeless people go to different areas because they're thinking about the opportunity. They're thinking about, you know, if I beg, I could probably make £140 a day, you know, and even though they'll make £140, the biggest issue is ID. If they don't have ID, they can't get into a hotel. You know, a lot of hostels don't take homeless people if they don't have ID. So they're just begging to have a lot of money and they can't really do much with it. And then that's when depression kicks in. That's when drugs kick in. And then they just start, you know, saying, you know what, I'm going to start just taking drugs. You know, and that's why a lot of the times when people think of a homeless person or even want to come into the soup kitchen, they're like, oh, is there druggies there? And, you know, is there this and there's that? They know if they're coming into the soup kitchen, all that stuff has to be parked outside. Sometimes you might get the odd, you know, someone might act in a bit erratic, but then they know the first thing we would have to do is zero tolerance to come outside. But we understand why they're like that. And I think a lot of the times people need to kind of identify why people are kind of like the way how they are. They can't spend the money on their homeless and depression sinks in. Drugs is like their escape from them. It's yeah. the only joy they have in life. And I, and I always say to people, try to understand it like this. I will do the soup kitchen. My escape is playing Grand Theft Auto. So I go home and play G. That's my escape. My twin brother, he smokes. So he will buy cigarettes, smoke. My sister, she drinks wine. That is our ways of escaping. It's like a quick little, maybe 20 minute escape. However, when people are on drugs, a lot of the times it's about escaping the harsh reality of life. You know, and especially that if they don't have nowhere to go, you know, you're probably seeing them doing craziness, but you didn't know why they're doing craziness. You know, so I always say to people, kind of always think outside the box on why you might see someone acting mad erratic. You know what I mean? Well, you first started giving food to the homeless at the age of 12 mm. from your Caribbean mother's soup kitchen? No, no it was from, um, so my parents, uh, um, so it's like I'm from a Caribbean background and especially on a Sunday that is like when they're making rice, peas, chicken. But my parents would always make rice and peas like they're cooking for like 30, 40 people. But there's only like three of us in the house. So I never really understood what, there's so much food. So then literally when I was on my way to school is, is when I used to kind of contain food and literally give it to the homes before I was to go to school. I've done that for like two years in terms of about in year eight, year nine. And then I kind of stopped and then kind of picked it up and I finished university. What were you thinking for the first, do you remember the first time you gave food to a homeless person? What were you thinking at the time? I was thinking, I am lucky. Like, I am privileged. You know, a lot of the times we're always, and don't get me wrong, it's always good to strive for more. 
but I think where the problem lies in, especially in humans, we don't appreciate what we have. We don't appreciate that, you know, we've got trainers on our feet, clothes on our back, go home, bed, covers, TV, Wi-Fi. We don't appreciate that first. So when we're striving for more, we'll get more, but still don't appreciate it. I done a talk at Swellside, Swellside HMP. That's a life is jail. I spoke to 150 inmates who serve in 30 years in jail. I said, if you was released from jail, what would be the first thing you would do? They said the first thing they will do is they want to be in traffic and just be making the breeze, just be blowing to them. For us, we hate being in traffic. We're like, oh man, let's use these new apps so we can miss the traffic. So it makes you think about things that we take for granted. Someone's in jail. Someone said, I just want to go in a park. I've never walked in a park. And, 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 and I thought about it and I'm like, I'm able to walk in the park whenever I want. These people dream. They're not dreaming about a Bugatti. They're not dreaming about having a million pound, having all the girls. They're saying, I just want to walk in the park. And that's when, for me, I had to take a, a, a next level of tolerance of life to kind of realise how lucky we are, even though we're in a council house, might not really have much, people kill to be at the level you are. You see what I'm saying? And all I'm trying to instal in, especially young people, that we get a lot of young people, a lot of schools coming in, we're saying Christmas is not about, Christmas is not about receiving gifts. This is where Christmas is now, is now flipped over on its head. Yeah, and it's a commercial holiday. Yeah, it's just like about, oh, now it's about, you know, my parents giving me all these gifts. And they don't understand the pressure they're putting on their parents to have Christmas, to have presents under the Christmas tree. Just to have that look. Parents are proper stressing. Because every parent wants to do that for their child. Christmas is about giving. Christmas has always been about giving. And I don't know when it made the change about receiving. I think it changed when companies realised they can make turn Christmas into a big, you know, once a year cash cow. Yeah. <laughs> and they started marketing that way yeah. to come and get it. Yeah. But yeah, so what I've gotten from you is that everyone in their mindset thinks they're poor. Mm -hmm. they, they think they're poor. They can't, reali they can't really realise that there's always someone that's suffering mm -hmm. and in a real state of, you know, depravity, poverty. Yeah. Yeah, like there's always, you know, I always say there's always people, yeah, it's good to have a moan and a, yeah, that's good to kind of let that type of anger out. But I think what people do with that anger, they just leave it as anger. And they don't actually think to say, but someone might be in a worse position than me. You know, oh, I lost my phone. Oh, bloody hell, I lost my phone. You're vexed that you lost your phone, but you're not actually thinking someone who's never even had a phone. They're probably still on Nokia, you know, and you're on an iPhone to, to do. So we don't just do um, people coming to the soup kitchen. We do food packs, so we go out to people's homes and kind of give them um, food parcels. And, you know, we've, we've gone to families where there's like seven kids, you know, feeding off one pack of biscuits. So for us, we would have to bring you a big shopping and like, and it, it it's humbling to see how thankful they are. When I'm going shopping and I'm seeing kids going, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. Because they're used to being given anything what they wanted. Not understanding there's someone in who's your age who's at home suffering. You know, there's a next, um, and, and kids who's not at school, they rely on the free school meals. So now it's six weeks holiday, they're not getting free school meals again. So we do a thing where we do well from, we'll cook about 60, 60 meals and bring it over to the library. And then we get like a lot of kids kind of coming in, etc. There's a lot of kids who, who really rely on free school meals. You know, without the free school meals, they're not eating. And that's when crime kind of comes in. You know, I was, I was with, you know, I was lucky enough for my state. Like I'm from this estate here. They call it, call it Summer Layton. I 
was privilege to have my mum and my dad in, in the same household. I this is the final question. How much worse do you think it has to get before the government decides to stop being embarrassed and actually put some work to actually stop this homeless crisis? Have you seen a film called City of Gods? City of God? Mm. Yeah, I have. It's a very popular Brazilian film, isn't it? It has to get like that. Where right now, I remember there was youth clubs left, right and centre until they closed them down. They're blaming drill music for all the killings. I'm saying don't blame drill music because I, as a youth worker, saw killings way before drill music. And drill music now is an expression of the government's neglect. That's what it's turned to. It's turned to where riots have to happen because people's being suppressed. It's gonna take the government to fix up when everybody just says they're not gonna have it no more. When everyone's gonna just be like, Do you know, and I've seen it, I remember the um I remember the London riots. I've never seen so many gangs working together. Even though, you know, there was looting and things like that for opportunists. But when I see people taking a stand, different areas all in one, that's when I was like, the police are now scared. The police right now have done anything in their power to create segregation. And that's why now in Brixton there's like 25,000 gangs and people can't go to different areas. That's all created by a government. But then at the same time, the government don't know how to control when everybody works together. And I think crisis will change when everybody decides to say, you know, they're not having it no more. I'm saying, you know, there's a killing, we do a march. I'm saying, why are we marching? There's still gonna be killings. You know, we're gonna be playing music, we're gonna be taking stuff down on YouTube but they're still killings. I'm saying we need to go to the root, to the root, to the root of the young people, no opportunities, you know, um, homelessness, mental health, you know, services, services starting from homes, services starting from families. Once those things are addressed, things will start changing. But until then, they need to see they need to see craziness first. You know, when when governments making when governments making um, like their their whole you know their whole government strategic plans, their strategic plans will never affect them. This is what people don't seem to understand, and this is why it's very important for people to vote as well, because Boris Johnson probably five years ago said, "Why am I?" going to be focusing on youth clubs if young people don't vote. So if you ain't got a voice, you're not heard, you know. And this is why I'm very much on saying young people need to kind of wake up, smell the coffee and just realise we were kind of putting this on ourselves. But at the same time, we need to all work together to create change. Very fine words, my brother. Awesome. It was a great interview.